Ben, go get my Bible. These are the words my dad told me one day when I was probably about mm, junior high, and a couple of guys showed up at our front door, um, white shirts, ties, I think you know who I'm talking about. But they were Christians, at least that's what they told me. They, they wanted to tell me about Jesus and the kingdom, so I start talking to them. I'm like, I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, we're all Christians, woohoo, right? My dad comes to the door, and he quickly surveys the situation, and he realizes quickly what he needs to do. And he says to me, Ben, go get my Bible. I might have shared this story with you before, but at that moment I felt like, a young squire getting the sword for the night, right? And I did. I went to, I got my dad his Bible, and there they started conversing and quickly came to realize that even though these guys at our front door were claiming to be Christians, they weren't representing Christ. And I learned two things that day. One, there are people who claim to be of Christ and really aren't of Christ. They they're teaching you a false Christ, a false gospel. And secondly, I learned a way to know that is to have your Bible. I learned those two truths through my dad that day. And, and that story for me is helpful because it reminds me, I think, of what we're getting into when we continue to study the letters of Peter. In fact, today, we're actually going to be getting into the second letter of Peter. We call this whole series the letters of Peter. And if there's one theme over both letters that I would put, it's to stand firm under pressure. Now, pressure comes to us in different contexts. In the first letter, we saw the pressures coming from the world. Sometimes it's from those who don't know Christ, who, who want to persecute us, who want to malign the name of Christ in our faith. And Peter's encouragement to those Christians, stand firm. Well, now we're going to start getting into this second letter where the pressures are not so much from without, but from within. Sometimes those within our own communities, sometimes those who claim to know Christ are not really of Christ. But the encouragement is still to stand firm. And there is a lot of discussion we can get into as it relates to Second Peter. There is a lot of things that can be said. This was one of the last letters, one of the last writings that was accepted into the canon of the New Testament. All kinds of debates as to whether Peter really wrote it or not. And if you, again, would like to take me out for lunch later today, your treat, I'd be happy to get into all those details. But suffice for this morning, we're going to say that Peter did write this, that this is a letter that he wrote as an apostle of Jesus Christ to those Christians. The same ones scattered, as we saw, all around Asia Minor, but for some different reasons. We see this in a number of different ways. This outline, and outline, this is not the only outline, but the way that I look at this is that he first wants to encourage these Christians to grow up, to mature in their faith as elect exiles. And he wants to give a warning. He wants to let them know that there are false teachers. There are those within the family of God, those who claim Christ, that you need to be careful about. A condemnation, therefore, against those false teachers. And finally, an encouragement, a confidence that Christ is returning. So at this point, anyone can say amen. So I'm going to try it one more time. That Christ is returning. Amen. amen. And he wants to give us confidence in that truth. That this life, this reality, is something that may hard, give us hardship and suffering. But there is hope yet to come. And so this, this letter, this continuation of Peter's writings, is something that we need to be encouraged about. And as we get into this section in particular, we're going to look at this first section. In particular, we're going to be looking at the first 11 verses of chapter 1 that Abe read through this morning. We're going to see this break down in a number of different ways, how he starts with this encouragement. All the writers do this, some kind of greeting and salutation. But then he quickly gets into some truths, first of what he has done, and then therefore our response of what we then 
should do. And therefore, that much more what we will receive because of it. And here's the encouragement I want to give to us from this passage. Elect exiles rejoice in what Christ has done so we can live as we should. Let me say that again. Elect exiles rejoice in what Christ has done. It is finished. This is why we call the gospel the good news. It's not something we have to do because it's something he's already completed. But because of what he has completed, we can now have a confidence. We can now have an encouragement to live in the ways that we should. Well, he starts off right at verse 1, this encouragement and his salutations and greetings. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. And I love the way that he starts this letter. His first identity, in terms of who it's from, is one who is a servant. In fact, the word he gives here is a slave. He's not a volunteer for Jesus. <laughs> He's one who is totally under the authority and command and commission of Jesus. Peter is not someone who sits on a throne, someone that, that we come to bowing down and kissing his finger. No, Peter understands he is simply a slave of the one we bow down to. He is one who was purchased, as he said in the first letter, by, by things, not perishable things like silver or gold, but by the precious blood of Christ, namely, sorry, the precious blood of the spotless land, namely Christ. His first identity is one of a slave. But then he goes on to say he's also an apostle. I thought this was great, that he wants to understand that he is a slave with authority. Doesn't that just sound silly almost? A slave with authority. Because that's exactly who he is. He understands he is under Christ and he is also representing Christ. He's an apostle. He's one appointed by Christ to preach the gospel. He is the, the, one of the ones whom the foundation of the church is laid on that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 2. So Peter is not writing with a bunch of suggestions. This is not Peter writing to the, the Christians saying, listen, I got some good opinions for you here. Guys, I got some good suggestions that you should consider if you want. <laughs> no, no, Peter is saying with the full authority of Jesus Christ himself. A slave, but a slave with authority. And we need to hear that today. This is not the opinion of God. These are the marching orders from God. And he says it to those who are of faith. Equal standing, as it were. But this equal standing we have is only available because of the righteousness of God. And please note that here, Peter has no problem addressing the righteousness of, God, of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He has no problem addressing deity to Christ. Unlike those guys that showed up at our, my front door many years ago, they, I mean, they believe in Jesus. He's a good guy. Oh, he's got some great teachings. He's a very moral individual. But they don't believe he really is God. Peter, on the other hand, no problem addressing Jesus as such. That Jesus is our God and Savior. He not only is the supreme being of the universe, but he's the one who came and saved us in our lowliest state. And so he opens this letter with the hopes that they may have grace and peace multiplied through the knowledge of God. Please don't miss that, though. Two things that our world is constantly seeking for, grace and peace. Peter says you can have those. But to truly experience those, to truly live in those realities. I, I, I've talked to many of my friends, individuals that do not know Jesus Christ. And can I say, I know some people that do not know Jesus that are filled with peace. They're, 
They're very gracious people. I know some atheists that are very graceful. And so in that sense, I realize the world can experience a certain measure of grace and peace, but they can't experience full grace and peace. That, that can only happen through the righteousness of God, through the knowledge of God, which is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And already Peter has talked so much about who we are in relation to who he is. This encouragement that godly grace and peace, true godly grace and peace, can only come through God and Christ. Helping us understand that elect exiles, we discover who we are when we know who he is. That's where we find our identity. That's where we find our purpose. And can I say, our world is telling us in all kinds of ways where to find our identity. Are they not? And mainly, the world is telling us, find who you are by looking in. On one side, our culture says, just look inside who you are. Find what identity you want to ascribe to. Find what, what sexual identity or racial identity. If you just look inward, you'll find who you are that much more. Or we go to the other side of our culture that says, listen, if you just get the right flag, if you get on the right political aisle, if you just have the right theories about all kinds of political conspiracies, then you can really be a true patriot in every sense of the word. And both sides of our culture want to tell us, you'll find your identity if you embrace what you want. You know what the gospel says? The gospel says you find out who you are when you look to who he is. I'm not saying all those other discussions aren't important. I'm not saying you can't be thankful for the country you live in. I'm not saying you can't be thankful for the color of skin you have. I know I am. Look at my tan, right? But those identities become such a lower priority when you know who you are in Christ. That's where we find our meaning, folks. And that's where Peter wants to encourage these elect exiles. The gospel doesn't minimize those identities, but it should prioritize those identities. Because that's what the gospel does. It gives us good news. And so that much more, he can then encourage us in light of what he has done. And look what he's done, by the way. His divine power. The his, I think, is in reference to the him in verse 2, Jesus Christ. Jesus is Christ, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So understand, Peter is trying to help us understand, the gospel may not give you everything you want, but it most definitely gives you everything you need. Isn't that a gospel even being preached today? Trust Jesus, and you too can be healthy, wealthy, and wise. You too can have the big houses with the big yachts and everything else. Just trust Jesus and he'll give you more, everything you want. To which Peter says, no, 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 no. You're missing the point. He gives us everything we desperately need. Life and godliness. But it's through him. It's through a relationship with him that we are then able to experience this life and, God, and look what he says, through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. And I love the way that Peter says this here. That this, this opportunity to, to live a life of godliness is through a knowledge. And it's not just information. Please see that. It's a knowledge of his glory and excellence. Do you understand that idea? That it's not enough just to know about Jesus. You need to experience Jesus. That it's not enough just to know great theological truths, which you do, but you need to experience those theological truths. 
There's a movie I really enjoy. If any of you have seen it, you know what I'm talking about. Goodwill Hunting. Has anyone ever seen that movie before? It's a, it's a story of this young man. He's a brilliant young man, and he's got some issues, and he's working with this therapist a character played by the late Robin Williams, if you've ever seen the movie. And there's this one scene where they're sitting on this park bench. And Robin Williams, I before, was struggling with him. But he gets to this certain point where he realizes, Will, as smart as he is, he hasn't really experienced life. And he says to him at this one point in the movie, you know, if I asked you about art, you'd probably give me the skinny on every book about art ever written. Michelangelo, you could probably give me all the details about him political aspirations, him and the Pope, the whole thing's right. But I bet you can't tell me what it smells like in the Sistine Chapel. That's what we call a burn. Because Will, that character, he knows all about Michelangelo, but he's never experienced the beauty of looking up at that roof and with all of his senses, experiencing the art of the artist. You can know a lot about Jesus. But do you know him in all his glory and excellence? That's what Peter is asking of us here. Because when you do, when you fully experience, both in knowledge and experience, the glories of who Christ is, you can then understand what he has granted you. This is why Peter says in verse 4, it's not just that he's given us promises. Peter doesn't just look at this as, oh yeah, by the way, he's given us some promises. Hmm. Look how he says it. Precious promises. Very great promises. Paul can't give enough words to explain these promises. They're promises, but to Peter, they're not just truths that he knows. They're experiences that he has lived. And he wants to share with his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. You too. I had, do you ever have that before? Do you ever go out to eat with somebody and you have just this amazing dessert? You take a bite of it and you go, mmm. Do you know what you do next? If you're with a loved one, don't do this, guys, if you're going out to lunch with another guy. But if you're with a loved one and you take a bite of that dessert, mm, you take a, here, taste this. You know why? You know why we want to share the joy that we have in experiences? It's because the, the enjoyment of it is almost not fully complete until it's shared with another person. That's what Peter's doing here. He wants the Christians then and the Christians here at ACC to understand that you too can experience Christ and have these promises. One of these promises relating to a positive and one relating to a negative. One promise is that you can become partakers of the divine nature. This is not saying you can be little gods. <laughs> That one day you'll have your own universe with all kinds of... No, 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 no. That's what actually some false teachers will say both then and even now. That's not what Peter is saying here. He's saying is that we get to partake of that attribute, those characteristics of the God who saved us. He's going to list out some of those here in a little bit. But one, the other promise, more on a negative, is that we also can escape the corruption that is in the world because of the sinful desires. We still live in a broken world. This is why Peter in his last letter would say in chapter 1, as obedient children, don't be conformed to the former lust which was yours, but be like the Holy One who called you to be holy. He urged us as aliens and strangers to abstain. There's still a battle to be sure, but you have a promise. Because when you dive into the excellencies of him, he promises you, he promises you, he promises you deliverance. It's not ready and not yet. And this encouragement that we see here, in light of what he has done, we understand his power grants our godliness. 
We understand that his promises provide our blessings. So elect exiles know what he has perfected in the past so we can live in the promises of the present. And it's not just what you know, but it's what you know. You know? I sound like Dr. Seuss now, don't I? But there has to be that truth that we can embrace, that we can joyfully engage with, with all the glory and excellence of who Christ is. Brothers and sisters, do you relish that? Do you find joy in that? There are so many other things in this world that are promising you joy. And let's be clear, they can provide for a little bit. They can sate our joy taste buds for a little moment. But do we really believe they can't hold a candle to the person and work of Christ? Do we live in those promises that he's already accomplished so we can live in the reality of today? Well, that much more, he wants to encourage us what we then must do. So, for this very reason. So, in light of all that he said, for this reason, what I've just said. Make every effort to supplant your faith with virtue, with knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. And this in itself, we could spend so much time looking at each of these characteristics, each of these virtues of, that we find in, in, in God that he is now encouraging us to hold on to. But I think the encouragement that he is ultimately saying is, is that all these truths about living in faith need to now be worked out, not to save us, but because we're saved. Do you get that? This encouragement is to remember that since God has given us his power for godliness, be godly. If that's what's been given to you, well then, do it. Keep pushing because there are false teachers in Peter's time and today that would like to tell you otherwise. They would like to say, you don't need to have self-control. Just do what you want. They would like to say, don't be godly. Just give in to your desires. The encouragement is to keep growing. And this is what he says in verse 8. For if. That's a big if, by the way. <laughs> Peter's assumption, Peter's hope is that they are, but the reality for you and I today is we may not choose to grow in these virtues. But if you do, here's another promise. If these qualities are yours and increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful. This is an encouragement to keep going. Don't just keep. Keep going. Do you get that? See, for, for Peter, I find it interesting. There's only one or two of uh, two options here. Either you are increasing or you're ineffective. Do you see that here? Those are the two options, my friends. There's no middle, I'm going to be sitting on the fence, Christian. I'm going to be content where I am, Christian. I'm just going to be right, okay, right here, Christian. Well, according to this passage, that's not an option. It's either you are increasing or ineffectual. Floating around, it's not an option. Just, just last week, I was suffering for Jesus down in the Caribbean. Someone has to do it, and I was willing to be that guy. And this one day, my wife and I, we went out to the beach, and it was a beautiful beach, and it's salt water, so you know how you can just lay back and just start floating? And I did that one time, and I remember thinking, okay, i got to remember where our stuff is. So I remember looking out to the beach, I was in the water, and there was a volleyball court. So that was my visual cue as to where our stuff was. It was by that volleyball court. Well, I lay back, oh, just soaking up the Caribbean sun and enjoying it. And within a minute, I stood back up and I went, what? how did the volleyball court get down there? 
uh, just so you know, the, the volleyball court didn't move. I did. The, the current of the ocean had moved me without any effort on my own. So I had to slouch back through the sand. And there I was, okay, there's the volleyball court laying back. And within another minute, I was further down the coast again. I kept on thinking, but I'm not doing this. The current's just taking me away. That's what Peter says happens to us. If you are not slouching through, and to be sure, brothers and sisters, it is work. If you think you can just float in the Christian life, be sure as anything, you will float away. The current of our culture will move you to be ineffective and unfruitful. So keep going. Keep moving. Because as he says in verse 9, if you lack these qualities, you are nearsighted. One that is blind, having forgotten what he's cleansed. I wore my glasses specifically for this message to make this point. Because I am nearsighted. If I don't wear these glasses, I just look out and you are all just fuzzy blobs of brothers and sisters. That's all I see. You know what I can't see though? Right about... Here, it gets really clear. Well, that's a lovely hand. But beyond that, everything else is fuzzy. You see, that's what the gospel does. The gospel gives you clarity beyond what's right in front of you. Because right in front of you, oh, more money. <laughs> I, mean, I, can, I can enjoy that. Uh, but more prestige, yeah, I want that. More recognition. Those are the things that are right in front of me that I go, yeah, that's what I want. But the gospel says, keep looking out. Let the gospel clarify your vision beyond what you can see right here. And don't forget the very precious promises you and I have. So keep moving. Keep growing in your faith so you can keep moving forward in your life. Don't be nearsighted. Don't forget that you've been cleansed from your former sins. Keep growing. And so he finishes then with this encouragement of therefore, in light of all that's been said, therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. And again, the encouragement is to remember, listen, God is the one who has saved you. You don't work for your salvation, but work because of your salvation. That's a huge difference. The good news is that Jesus Christ died for your sins. He finished the work. And so we don't keep working in all this diligence of faith to earn God's favor. No, no, no. That favor's already been secured for you on the cross. Praise God. But because that salvation is secure, because of what he has done, the encouragement is to make your election and calling sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. This is what Peter is trying to say to us, continually trying to challenge us. This, to me, is like my relationship with my wife. I, I don't work hard in my marriage to get my wife to like me. Newsflash, she already likes me, I think, most of the time. She married me. We are already in love. I don't work to earn her love. I work because she's my love. This is what Peter is encouraging us with Christ. Look how much God loves you. Keep working because of it. In fact, keep practicing it so you don't fall back. Keep practicing it so you're ready to be received. Paul in Corinthians would talk about some Christians who are saved, as it were, by fire. Meaning, they didn't live a very effective Christian life. And so God, in his wisdom, said, you're done. Don't be that Christian. Be that Christian who can stand before God and hear him say, well done. 
good and faithful servant. Elect exiles trust deeply in God's salvation and work diligently in our sanctification. I remember hearing a story of some missionaries one time who were traveling back to their homeland, to the to their country of origin, and it was back in the day, so they were on a boat. On this same boat was an ambassador from that country as well. As the old missionary couple were getting off on one gangway, the, the ambassador was getting off on another one, and there, greeting the ambassador was some big fanfare. Bands and banners and all kinds of celebration, welcoming back the ambassador from a far land. And the old missionary as he was walking off, leaned over to his wife and asked, why didn't we get a big band? Where's our fanfare? To which the wise old missionary wife simply says, well, dear, we're not home yet. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you. As Peter is telling these Christians here, we need to work diligently because when we rejoice in what Christ has done, we can live as we should. But don't get that order mixed up. Find joy in who he is and what he's done to give you the strength, to give you the power to live joyfully in the ways that we should. Is it going to be hard? I promise you it will be. But is it going to be worth it? God's word promises it will be. Father, we come to you this morning and we are thankful for the work that you have accomplished. Lord, I realize though, I am prone to want to float. I want to just relax and take it easy. But the reality is, Lord, if you've done already the work for me, I need to ask myself, am I living joyfully in that? And I pray for us as a community, Lord, that you would help us, even as we're preparing to continue to worship you in song, even as we'll be preparing to take that little piece of bread and that juice that celebrates the good news of the gospel. May we be that much more motivated to get those promises, to live in those very precious and wonderful promises that we don't have to live according to the world, but that, Lord, we can grow up in all those virtues you've commended commended to us. Help us, Lord, I pray. Thank you for this truth. May you be glorified because of it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we speak of...